our headline stories. Earning from resources. Now, the prospect of earning revenue for uh, South Africa has increased, and this is hinged on crude oil and platinum. Both have the potential to further lift the rainbow nation out of recession. Can these help Africa's most industrialized nation back to profitability? We'll take a look at this in the course of the show. We'll also look at the outcome of the summit on financing African economies, where African leaders as well as global leaders and lenders, that's very important, met to discuss Africa's economic post-COVID future. I'm Tululokwe Adela Rubandogun. Welcome. This is Business Edge. South Africa wants a free 20% stake in oil and gas exploration and production ventures under a new upstream petroleum bill, which allows the minister to reserve petroleum blocks for black investors. Now, this is according to a copy of the bill, which was recently released. The upstream petroleum resources development bill approved by the cabinet is meant to help regulate a nascent industry in the country following new offshore gas fines by Francis Total that have helped unlock a new petroleum frontier off South Africa's coast. If the legislation is passed in its current form, it could mean vast sums flow into state coffers. But it could also put off investors at a time when the world is turning away from fossil fuels due to climate change and the impact of COVID-19 continues to weigh on investment decisions by oil majors. Now, introduced by Mineral Resources and Energy Minister, the bill deals specifically with the oil and gas industry and is not lumped together with the established mining sector after a broad pushback from oil companies on the free carry proposal when it first was muted almost a decade ago. So joining me to get into this, I have Nasir Afalabi Abulaya, News Essentials Business Editor. Nasir, so South Africa looks to join an organization, an elite club, uh, currently right now, but they do have a few issues they need to work out. So data suggests that South Africa is the 48th country in terms of oil reserves here on the continent. The oil major, Total, is the only firm seemingly conducting exploration at this point in time or not. So let's find out who is conducting exploration, who's involved in exploring the oil and gas fields that South Africa has. So basically, everybody is trying to see if they can get new investment. But mm -hmm. Total seems to be the most, uh, the, the, the fiercest. Recall that they have uh, stopped uh, their exploration activity in Mozambique, Mozambique due to insecurity. Yes. So they needed to really get a, a, a new uh, viable income source. And they struck gold in South Africa. So they have been most aggressive. Uh, I, initially, most people thought that uh, BP, considering that they've had some say, say, poor performance of late, in fact, really, since the, the deep, uh, Deepwater Horizon incident in the United States, mm. they have been truly struggling. Uh, it was expected that they would be more aggressive. But somehow, uh, the French majors total really uh, hit Stepped the- Stepped up. Literally, mm -hmm. and they struck gold. And now they are leading the chart. And with this, uh, they will be in a in poor position to partner with Petrol SA mm -hmm. in, uh, say, in reaping the benefit of this. Well, uh, like I said, uh, BP is there, Chevron is also there, and even Shell. But they are not as aggressive, aggressive as most people expected them to be. Okay, so we'll see how that plays out because with a petroleum industry bill that identifies and addresses some of these issues, it may also, of course, push those up, uh, push up the other international oil companies to step up their game as well. So we're looking at South Africa exploring now oil and gas particularly, but they can also learn lessons from countries that have been there before, a country I shall continue to not name right now, <laughs> as it may be. But do we know of any plans that South Africa may have in terms of refining their own capacity to refine um, and take a lot more of the chunk of earnings along the value chain of this or send it out like some we know and then just bring back finished products for themselves? What's the, what, what's the consideration? What's the conversation in regards to that? No, that is one of the reasons why uh, the, 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 the law lawmakers are going through the nitty gritties of this particular mm. bill. Now, they want to... Uh, they're checking the benefits, and really, there is no overemphasizing it. Having local refining capacity ensures that you get all the benefits from your from the resources, from the crude oil in particular. And this would be on the table. But now they need to consider how will they fund it. So, will the oil majors be interested in partnering with them 
to do this within South Africa. That's the bigger discussion. Mm -hmm. Remember, uh, in your write up there, you read that uh, yeah, South Africa will earn 20% from exploration, 20% from production. Mm -hmm. That means that whatever, whoever they partner with, they will still get a good chunk. chunk yeah. Now, when 80% goes to the partner, and it could be partners, it, it's possible Joint it could ventures. be like two, three, definitely, mm -hmm. two, three individuals who will come together uh, to help them build these refineries over time. Now, the, the major thing is putting the money down with the expertise and hit the ground running. I believe that all things will equal before this year runs out. We should have some green light on how this would pan out. Okay. So this bill that's being introduced in South Africa is actually separate from regulatory bills or regulatory laws that govern South Africa's mining sector, which unfortunately has been hit uh, because of issues with ESCOM. So this bill is literally going to stand alone. They're treating this industry, this sector, as a standalone, as an individual on its own. What can we expect in terms of how this bill might play out uh, for regulations? How soon do we see? Is there a timeline in terms of how soon it can be passed into law and movements can start uh, much more on this new industry for South Africa? Unfortunately, there's no specific timeline, but considering the exigency of uh, the outcome, that is a showing that South Africa earns more money, mm -hmm. it, it would uh, get utmost attention from the lawmakers. Everybody knows that South Africa is still in recession. So that is uh, something which they would want to put as uh, one of the first uh, two or three things on their agenda. So yes, the lawmakers would talk about this. But now, oh, another thing is, they need to check which uh, firm they will partner with. That is also something that uh, they would really, really scrutinize well. Yeah. That is why it will be an open debate uh, in Parliament, because uh, they, will, uh, they will possibly invite all these uh, oil majors to come and make their case on uh, what and what they can do and how South Africa will benefit, and also how soon they will be able to move to site. These are very important and pertinent questions that uh, the lawmakers would ask each and every potential oil major and even also local ones also yes. who want to be partners with Petro SA. Okay, let's see what that happens and what that plays out to be. So we mentioned the economy, we mentioned the fact that unfortunately South Africa is still in a recession, but there are expectations that the country will earn 20% for both extractive and production revenue if this new petroleum industry bill passes. That should, of course, help boost foreign reserves in South Africa considerably. But beyond the foreign reserves, how can this help the country's economic position as it stands? Manufacturing. We all know that South Africa is the most industrialized nation in Africa. So now, the value chain of crude oil is something that uh, every nation uh, would want to have. Because uh, many chemicals that uh, many nations do buy, you can have it as a byproduct of uh, petrol or diesel. So, uh, considering this, 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 now, petroleum jelly that most people use uh, to lubricate themselves and even oil lubricants, these are byproducts, not the main refining thing. So, uh, the, the, the industrial sector in South Africa would get more raw materials locally. Mm -hmm. Of course, that will further boost capacity. Now, ESCOM, that's, you know, that has been bedeviled with so much problems over the years, would also get raw material to power its, uh, its generating capacity. So it's a win-win situation for South Africa. That is if... It's managed correctly. Exactly. Okay. Uh, the main thing is having refineries there. If they don't have refineries, it's part of uh, this bill, it might not work out well. So are we joining OPEC or are we joining OPEC plus or are we staying independent? What direction do you think South Africa will follow in regards to this? Well, as it is right now, it is better for them to just start on their own mm -hmm. Uh, without joining anybody so that they will be able to determine what they sell to the world. Now, if they join OPEC or any other cartel, they will be limited, uh, uh, they, they cannot determine what they sell. Whatever the cartel agrees, it will be their output. But being on your own, you determine what you produce, you determine who you sell to. So it is better for South Africa at the moment to actually be independent. All right. Let's not forget to mention another finite mineral resource that South Africa is also looking at to help them in terms of bringing in more revenue, and that's platinum. So very quickly on this, what's the situation with the platinum reserves? What intentions do we see that South Africa has? No, uh, platinum is one of the wonderful resources which South Africa is blessed with. And uh, the first quarter of 2021 has seen a rise in this precious metal. And with this, South Africa stands to, uh, interestingly, and more revenue. Uh -huh. But 
Unfortunately, ESCOM is still a major issue here. Now, because uh, the mines are not getting optimum capacity, optimum energy mm -hmm. to power themselves, they are not uh, producing as much as they can. So if they agree that to be off grid, remember uh, Johannesburg and Cape Town has pulled off uh, ESCOM, so they are independent. Now, if the mines also uh, have this sort of agreement amongst themselves, to be independent and generate their own power supply. Oh, it is possible that South Africa's platinum industry would earn more for the nation. All right, so a lot of possibilities, a lot of potential, but we're looking for the actualities and the realities as it stands for South Africa's economy and their mining and now petroleum industry as well. But I want you to hold on to some numbers before we go on a break, and those numbers are 33 billion, 650 billion and 100 billion dollars what do they mean for the continent when we come back we'll look at the outcome of the summit on financing of african economies held in paris france and the numbers will make sense stay with us Now, France has called on other rich countries to follow its example and commit to reallocating parts of their international monetary fund special drawing rights to Africa, so the continent can triple its share of new funding support. Africa is earmarked to receive $33 billion out of an injection of $650 billion that the IMF is preparing to give out to its member countries later this year. A collective effort is underway to boost that amount from 33 to $100 billion. Now, the summit drew participation from IMF Managing Director Kristalina Gregovia. Uh, we also had the German Chancellor Angela Merkel, U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, and the Vice Premier of China, Hang Zeng, the world's top bilateral lender to developing economies. That is China, of course. Now, while President Emmanuel Macron, the host, said the meeting led to a change of mindset, it stopped short of securing the financial firepower African economies need. The IMF estimates that the continent faces a funding gap of $345 billion through to 2023. Now, before we get into our conversation, here's a bit more about the summit. The purpose of the summit is to support the economic recovery of African countries that have been affected by the health and economic crisis caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. It also aims to foster investments in Africa and avert the risk of excessive debt. The summit hopes to improve the solvency of African nations. How solvent or insolvent are many African countries? Delegates will deliberate on debt relief and support from the International Monetary Fund, IMF, through special drawing rights, SDRs. Leaders will also look at how to provide capital to the private sector on the African continent to support investment that will catalyze inclusive economic activity, create employment and accelerate the attainment of sustainable development goals. The Summit on the Financing of African Economies follows a series of global stimulus packages initiatives, including the World Bank's $14 billion fast-tracking of COVID-19 financing, the African Development Bank's $10 billion COVID-19 response facility and the International Monetary Fund's concessional financing and debt relief to assist countries and companies in their response to the pandemic. The European leaders, representatives of G7 and G20 countries and of international institutions such as the IMF, World Bank, Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD, are among summit delegates. But will these financing options be without interest? or merely suspended for the period that COVID-19 is still alive. So a lot of questions there, but you also would have seen Nigeria's President Mohamedou Buhari, as well as the Director General of the World Trade Organization, Dr. Ngozi okonjo weala Also present was the uh, President of the African Development Bank, Dr. Akiwumi Adeshina. So it was really a conference, a summit of the heavy hitters of African economies and those who can make the necessary decisions. So we know that less than 150,000 people have died from the coronavirus in Africa. It doesn't mean that because our numbers are low that the hits, that the feelings are not there. But the pandemic has unfortunately hurt incomes, including exports and tourism revenues. It's pushed millions of Africans either back into poverty or right on the brink. The continent needs all the help that she can get. 
Nasir, do we think that this conference, this summit, another one of this, is going to make any difference for us? Well, uh, in the interim, it will have uh, a good impact because, yes, there will be uh, more money that will be available for many African nations. Mm. So with that, uh, Africa can, say, restart uh, the recovery process. And also, you know, it has been mentioned that uh, interest rates uh, will be on freeze. And even uh, th what that has to be is a per country basis. You have to ask for it before mm -hmm. you get it. Mm -hmm. That has always been so this was not a collective bargaining a collective mm. resolution kind of conversation this no. was it, general when it comes to the special drawing rights but each individual country is going to have to come forth with what they want exactly because mm. each nation has different needs now uh, many nations uh, who are heavy who rely a lot on tourism now it is known that yes those have peculiar needs uh, talking about south africa kenya zimbabwe zambia egypt now they have specific needs uh, they need to ensure that their hotels are working again that they, are, they have more people flying into their country so those nations are definite mm -hmm. what they need now other nations who uh, have more say infrastructural deficits uh, unfortunately nigeria is one of these uh, particular category uh, in Ghana also. Now, these nations also have their needs. Uh, they need to ensure that these infrastructures are revamped, that they are able to support the economy. So all these needs will determine what each country gets. All right, so beyond the needs, which is apparently more than the $33 billion earmarked. How do I know this? Well, Senegal's president, Macky Sall, said the current earmarked special drawing rights of about $33 billion for the continent is a drop in the ocean. $33 billion is a drop in the ocean. What other reactions have we gotten from some of the uh, resolutions or the consequences of the finance summit? Well, um, there has been a proposal to increase it to $100 billion. Mm. Now, this uh, will ensure that more African nations get more than what was initially agreed. Now, this will really go a long way, like I, as I mentioned earlier. But it is still categorically not enough. Now, in what you read earlier, you did mention something, uh, uh, what the IMF proposed, that there's a funding gap for mm -hmm. African nations. Up to 2023, that just, that's just two years' time. Yeah. So that means that Africa really needs more help. Because we have more vaccines now, and uh, a good number of nations are opening their borders to commerce, does not mean that everything is still Uhuru. It isn't. Our airlines are not flying at maximum capacity. Now, uh, many uh, exports are not at where they were pre-COVID. Mm. So it means that African nations are not earning what they can earn. So it is still, it is, means that we still need assistance. Okay. So one from it, the other. it's interesting that you mentioned the issue of vaccines because the summit called for support for Africa's vaccine production by voluntarily sharing intellectual property and actively transferring technologies. We've also seen this move uh, by President Joe Biden, who has approved uh, that, I think it is the Pfizer uh, vaccine, that the technology behind it be shared, the copyright and the intellectual property. Now, such arrangements would help African countries to also manufacture their own vaccines, which is a key issue where less than 2% of the continent's population has received a vaccine. This is compared to 36% of Europeans who have so far been given a dose. What do we make of that? Well, unfortunately, there is a degree of COVID fatigue on the African continent. Well, as it is everywhere. True, but the apathy is more here than there. Mm. Now, of course, this uh, stems from lack of uh, the chronic distrust of most governments. Uh, for instance, I believe, was it Ethiopia or Sudan, or South Sudan, where people literally ran away from being vaccinated? Mm. It is it's really appalling. But even many people query the fact that uh, uh, there's a new plan to manufacture these vaccines locally. locally. Uh, most people seem to have forgotten that HIV vaccines, I mean, sorry, drugs, have been made locally in most African nations mm. to reduce the cost. It is still the same logic that went into this argument, that if you can produce uh, the vaccines locally, the cost will be further reduced so that more nations can vaccine, uh, can vaccinate more people. I believe that this is a wonderful plan that will go further in helping people. For instance, now, uh, the, the weather in Africa has helped. 
but the vaccines will go a long way in helping further. So with this, we'll be able to open our borders more to commerce. And then, of course, we can make some more money. So the summit ended a day after Emmanuel Macron announced that France would also be in favor of cancelling $5 billion of Sudan's debt to support the reconstruction of the country that's emerging from decades of dictatorship. Now, Sudan has been getting a lot of relief. What's next? All this debt cancel cancellation that's coming for Sudan, what are the next steps we're expecting from Sudan? Well, literally, right now, Sudan is the new baby of the world. Mm. And everyone is really coming to the table, from the U.S. to the Irish, you know, even the Chinese. Everybody wants to help Sudan to be, say, the poster child of success, of reforms. And even within Sudan itself, they are truly taking the bull by the horn. Uh, like within the last 24 hours, uh, the interim government there sat a judge because they were stalling the judicial process. Mm. Now, this shows that this government is really proactive. They are not like the old government, that it's a real, uh, like, a, like a cartel. So if you're close to the government, you are immune. This government is saying that, no, we are for the people. We want to serve the people. So, and the world has been listening, has been watching what has been happening in Sudan. And consequently, many people are coming to help Sudan. Even Saudi Arabia did something quite interesting, cancel the debt of Sudan also. A and lot of debts. Ex a lot. The country has been running on a lifeline for decades. And right now, the social reforms going on within Sudan will ensure that this country mm. will, uh, so within the next three to five years, will be far different from what they had been going to for the past 20 or so years. Okay. We'll be expecting, and I think it's time that Business Edge also focuses on some of the things happening in Sudan as well. But some questions also remain. This conference, this summit, was hosted by French President Emmanuel Macron, and France has typically had a history of just staying within its boundaries and only influencing or involving itself on the issues of Francophone African countries more than across the continent, more than continent-wide, but this is slightly different. So there are those who are also concerned as to the hand that France is extending as well and why France seems to be the one pushing for this. It's France now, it's been China before, it's been Japan as well, it's been Russia as well. Um, the question may be now, who is next to host the next African Economic Summit outside of the continent? And when will we see African leaders meet here on the continent to discuss these same issues at the invitation of one of the leaders? It's a question we'll look forward to having an answer to. Nasir, thank you so much, as always, for joining me. Great Let's give you NC4 to watch before we wrap things up. We start in South Africa, where the Southern African Department of Mineral Resources and Energy has said that ESCOM is set to provide more households with reliable power during the 2021-22 financial year through the implementation of the Integrated National Electrification Program. The department said that the program will help to connect 180,000 additional households to energy above the 166,886 connected in the 2020-21 financial year. Moving on now, we head to Kenya, where Kenya electricity generating company Kengen is set to begin drilling works on the $6.5 million or 709.8 million Kenyan shilling geothermal power project starting June this year. The international contract was awarded to Ken Jen three months ago following an agreement with the Djiboutian Office of Geothermal Energy Development. The project involves drilling three geothermal wells at the Gala Le Kome geothermal field as well. Now moving to Nigeria, the Edo State government in Nigeria's southern region is set to benefit from a $250 million financing deal from the United States for oil palm and cassava value chain development special agro-processing zones, as well as renewable energy infrastructure in the state. This was disclosed at the Fias Oil Palm Plantation Expansion Ribbon Cutting Ceremony. And finally, on our list of things we're looking out for, the first quarter of 2021 shows a 78% drop in tourist arrivals, representing 230,000 tourists who didn't go to Morocco, compared to the same period in 2020. And the figures are part of those announced by the Ministry of Solidarity and Special Development. Now, air traffic through Moroccan airports was also impacted, recording a 70% drop. The minister added that the drop in air traffic is forecasted to persist until 2023 with full recovery expected in 2024.
And that's it on this edition of Business Edge. Follow us on social media. We are at New Central TV. Head to our website, download our mobile app on Play Store and App Store. And of course, you can follow us on our YouTube channel. Until next time, I'm Tolu Lopwe, Adelaru Balogun. <laughs>